Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. Write this topic in your notes this morning. Understanding the nature of the kingdom. Understanding the nature of the kingdom. I want to get right into this because we don't have a lot of time, but I want to cover as much material as possible. You can take a look at the screens to take notes from. But I want to speak on this subject, the kingdom spirit of leadership, understanding the nature of the kingdom. We've been dealing with this issue of the kingdom for the last few months now, and uh, the more I study this, the more I understand how much I don't know. This past week, war broke out again in Croatia and in the Balkan states, where they're still fighting as a result of tribal wars. And these tribal wars are between ethnic groups that have been seemingly at a peace settlement some months ago. They're still fighting again. Of course, in the northern Pakistan, there was some bombings that took place again this week. In Israel, a car bomb went off and a few people were killed. And of course, the danger of living is becoming more and more frequent. There seems to be no stability in the world today. I think you all who have been listening to the news know that the, the highest prosperity progressive movement in the United States that took place in the last 12 years fell apart last week. The stock market has fallen so low that people have lost millions of dollars overnight. In the United States right now, they say that some of those who were millionaires on Monday grew up, they woke up on Tuesday and they were broke because they had all their monies in the technology stocks which fell apart this past week. The world is so unpredictable. You can be rich today, poor tomorrow. I just left Seattle, Washington, where the largest airplane manufacturer, Boeing, which creates and makes the largest airplanes in the world, just decided to shut down their largest plant in Seattle, and they're moving everything out. The governor of Seattle announced this week, and I had the chance to meet the mayor uh, a few days, a couple of days ago, I was talking to the mayor of Seattle, and they all frustrated and afraid because thousands of jobs are expected to be lost just overnight. People have lost hope in the systems. They they're afraid of what might happen to them tomorrow. There's no way that you can live in a world that we live in without some trust in a God who's bigger than the world. Would you say? The Bahamas itself is. It's really prosperity based on a mistake made by a man 45 years ago. His name is Cuba it's Castro. Castro is an old man now. He made an announcement two weeks ago that he's opening up Cuba to more investment. The United States Congress have just passed a new bill where Americans can now do more trade with Cuba. Money is moving in. Some of the hotel chains of our world are now establishing hotels in Cuba. Cuba is about 15 minutes from our southernmost island and has beautiful beaches just like ours. How stable is our economy? What's going to happen if that place opens up tomorrow morning and becomes a tourist mecca? What about our stability economically? The world is so unstable. Therefore, if you don't put your trust in God and you put your trust in horses and chariots, they're going to fail you. What I want to talk about today is a kingdom that cannot be shaken. One that is not built on the U.S. stock exchange or the Bahamas tourist industry. It's not built on the instability of the governments of the Baltic states and those in the Middle East of so much insecurity. We're talking about a kingdom that is stable in the midst of all of that. 
As a matter of fact, that is why God did not send us a religion. Because religion cannot keep you in chaos. The problem in Kosovo today is a religious problem between the Christians and the Muslims. In the northern part of Pakistan and also the northern part of Nigeria, the fighting, there's a religious fight between Muslims and Christians. So God did not send us a religion. He didn't send us an economy to build our faith on. He sent us a kingdom to become a part of. And this kingdom is in existence now. And I want to speak briefly about the nature of this kingdom and the attitude that Christ wants us to have as we become citizens of this kingdom. I give some notes here. I'd like you to just take notes of them if you will. And that is the very goal of God sending Jesus Christ was very simple. And that was to reintroduce the kingdom of God on earth and to do it through mankind. Jesus came to restore the righteousness and the holiness of mankind back to the earth. And thirdly, he came to restore the Holy Spirit back to man. Fourthly, he came to retrain mankind to think like God. And fifth, he came to restore the kingdom rulership of God on earth through mankind. And finally, he came to return the kingdom of heaven to God's earthly kings. There are some scriptures that I have noted next to these statements. You may want to take those scriptures and write them down, read them for yourself, because every statement that I make must be scripturally sound, biblically correct, theologically grounded, and it must be verifiable by the word of God. The kingdom then is the issue on the mind of God, not a religion. If you notice the words that are used in this list of the goals of Jesus, the goals he came to achieve, are all including the words that have a prefix. Do you see those words? He came to reintroduce. He came to restore the righteousness of holiness of mankind. He came to restore the Holy Spirit. He came to restore the kingdom rulership of God on earth. He came to return the kingdom of heaven to God's earthly kings. Each one of these statements is a sermon in itself. Because each one have to be explained in detail for us to be reconditioned and properly retaught. But just suffice it, let me just mention a few thoughts about each one. You can write these statements, comments down. He came to reintroduce the kingdom of God to man on earth. In Matthew 4, 17, the statement reads, And from that time, Jesus began to preach, The kingdom of heaven has arrived, or is at hand, or has returned. His message is, the kingdom of heaven has arrived. His first word is, therefore, repent, or change your thinking. Then he came to restore righteousness and holiness of mankind. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says that if any man is in Jesus Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed before because everything has become new. And it says, we are the righteousness of God in who? In who? Christ Jesus. Write the word righteousness down, please. Very important word, righteousness. It doesn't mean to wear long gowns and robes and crosses and wear turbans and and look religious but the word righteous means to be realigned properly with authority righteous means to be right positioned to be properly positioned with authority so that you can receive from that authority that's what righteousness means so Jesus came to put us back in the right relationship or position with the authority of God's kingdom so we can obtain and enjoy the privileges of God's rulership in our lives. 
He came to restore that. Holiness is the other comp component of his work, and that is the word for purity. But it means pure in motive. So holiness means that there is no schizophrenia in your life. Uh, what you say and what you do are the same. That's what holiness means. Holiness is another word that we can use for integrity. We are integrated. To be holy means that you are pure. There's no ulterior motive in your life. What you see is exactly what you are. That's holiness. Holiness means to be pure from the inside out, the outside in. What you say is what you live. What you live is what you are. What you are is what you say. It's holy. That's what holiness is. Christ came to give us back again a holy heart. So we can be pure people like our Father in heaven. He came to then restore the Holy Spirit. Luke 11, 13 says, It is my Father's pleasure to give you the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, that statement is made in regards to a question about the kingdom. They asked him about the kingdom. And he said, The kingdom of God is for you, he says. He says, Which of you, having children, if they ask you for a stone, if they ask you for bread, rather, would you give them a stone or they ask you for an egg will you give them a serpent he says of course not you won't do that he says then even so my father if you ask him for the Holy Spirit he will give you the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the key to the kingdom he is the access to the kingdom of God matter of fact he is the manifestation of the kingdom of God so he came to restore the Holy Spirit the greatest act of Jesus was not Calvary Many people center our faith on Calvary. Calvary is a means to an end. Calvary is the mechanism that God used to cleanse you and I, to make us holy temples. Because sin was our problem. And there's no eradication of sin without blood. Everybody say blood. The word of God in Leviticus says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So in order for us to get rid of sin, we need blood. So the Calvary Act was to provide the atoning work, the blood work, so God could forgive our sins, not ignore them, but forgive them. God does not ignore sin. God deals with it. And the way you deal with sin is you have to cleanse it. To cleanse it, you've got to pay the price that sin demands. Sin demands two things. It demands blood and death and Christ provided both when he did that he made us holy again pure again so we can receive the Holy Spirit everybody say receive the word sieve means to have to receive means to have again and so we used to have him we lost him he came redeemed us now we can receive the Holy Spirit again and the Bible says that the kingdom of God is love joy and peace where in the Holy Spirit so if you don't have the Holy Spirit you don't have the kingdom of God any religion without the Holy Ghost is not a kingdom religion if I can use the term religion respectively and so we need to understand then that his his major goal was to get that spirit back in us so the resurrection was not enough Calvary was not enough it's getting that Holy Spirit back in us that was the key and that's why the first thing he did when he rose from the dead was he called a meeting with his followers, his disciples, and he walked through the wall and he said, Be of good cheer. It is done. It's finished. I am going now to my father, unto your father, to my God, unto your God. And then the Bible says he went to them and he went to each one personally and he breathed on them and he said, Receive the Holy Spirit. That was his greatest act. Well, that makes sense. The Bible says he breathed on them. Everybody say breathe on them. Breathe. Say it loud. Breathe. He breathed on them what? The Holy Spirit. He says receive. It was the same act that he did in the book of Genesis. Chapter 2 verse 7. When he carved the body of man from the dust. And then he breathed into man the breath of life. And man lost that breath. The Holy Spirit when he sinned and now he is the creator doing it one more time. He's putting back what man used to have. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our connection with heaven. 
He is our link between the seen and the unseen. He is our mediator between the earthly realm and the invisible realm. He is therefore the contact with the kingdom. Everybody say contact with the kingdom. Everybody say kingdom contact. The Holy Spirit is our kingdom contact. Without him, there's no contact with the kingdom of God. And that is why the first person you receive when you are born again is the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus said, except a man be born of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Because the Spirit is the kingdom of God in manifested form. He also came to re retrain mankind to think like God. Uh, John 16 verse 13 is a powerful statement. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will teach you all things. Now to teach is not to preach. The Holy Spirit is not a preacher. He's a teacher. To teach means, write this down, to teach means to instruct for change. To teach means to instruct for change. When you are a teacher in a classroom, you're not preaching. You're not trying to announce things to the, to the students. What you want to do is to transfer your information to them so it can become their information so that the same change it brings to you can bring to them so the Holy Spirit's job is to take everything that he knows and to give it to you that's why Christ says he will not speak of himself but he will only teach you what he heard from me to retrain is an important work why do we need retraining because if you've been a slave for 400 years like the Israelites were, it's tough to think like a king again. But we as humans, based on biblical chronology, we've been slaves for over 6,000 years. This is the 7,000 year we are in now. Could you imagine being in darkness for 6,000 years, all of a sudden you're in light? Imagine being oppressed for 6,000 years, and suddenly you're free, and now you got to think freedom? It's tough. You can be in slavery so long, that's slavery becomes a lifestyle that's why <laughs> I'm afraid to say this anyhow that's why thank you Lord should I say this now this tape may get me in trouble but I'll say it that's why Jesus doesn't set us free Jesus delivers us but somebody else comes after him he says to work on our mind who's that the Holy Spirit that's why Moses couldn't set the Israelites free God has sent another person who wasn't born in Egypt Joshua to work on their minds it's tough to change the mind of a person who've been oppressed for 6,000 years and that's why the Holy Spirit's job is to retrain us to think like our original self. Everybody say renew. Say it loud. Write that word down please. It's found in the book of Romans chapter 12. It's a good place to pick it up. Romans chapter 12 uh, verse 2. It says be not conformed to this world. But be ye what? Transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. Now let's go back and read it again. It says, be not conformed. The word conform means to actually shaped by. In other words, Paul is saying, you and I, born in sin, conceived in sin, shaped in iniquity, shaped in iniquity. That means the world formed us. Satan formed our thinking. His mentality, his concepts are what runs our lives. That's why you can be born again and still think evil. Because we are not we, we, we're not mentally changed when we are spiritually regenerated. He says, be ye transformed by what? The renewing of the mind. So you are conformed to this world. Who was he writing to? Christian people, believers. But they were still not conformed to God's kingdom. They were still conformed to the world. So Paul says, please, be no longer conformed or think like or mentally controlled by this world. But be ye changed or transformed how? By the renewing of your mind. Everybody got the word renew down? You sure? I want you to write it again. But take away the prefix. 
separate them there's re and there's what new now the prefix re means what it doesn't mean to go forward it means to go what backward re is a prefix which means to go back to the original state write that down re means go back to the original state whenever you see that word starting with re it means to go back to the original state so God says I don't want you to have a new mind that's your problem I want you to go back and get the old original mind and when you get that he says you'll be transformed hallelujah God wants us to be changed back into something not to something hmm. he wants us to be restored back to the mentality before the fall so that we can have the mind of the original Adam who was dominating the whole world in charge of the world he was in charge of the animals what he called them that's what they were by the way when you name something you own it write that down the Hebrew concept of naming is to control so when you name something you actually own it you control it that's why God told Adam to name all the animals why you are in charge of them when you name them you take charge have you noticed that most of the people in our country who own big business name them after themselves hmm it's a hint Solomon's Kelly's there's only one guy who looked like me who did it Butler when you name something you master it Adam was a controller he was a dominator and that's the mentality God wants us to be restored to the word dominion means to govern to rule to control to lead to manage to have authority over that means Adam was a dominator a controller he was a ruler he was a king and that's what Christ came to restore he came to restore to retrain us to think like that do you know that you can be a prince but think like a slave The Bible states very clearly in Galatians chapter 3 and chapter 4 the problem of mental transformation. And Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, he says that the, the, the son is just like a slave and therefore he needs tutors. What's a tutor for? To teach that royal kid how to think like a royal king. That is the the art of the Holy Ghost his work is to make you stop being afraid of God and to make you at the end call God Abba he says the Holy Spirit job is complete when you call God Abba what is Abba it's the word for father what is Abba source so what is Abba Abba is equal. Okay. You'll get it someday. See, you will continue to be a Christian until God becomes your Abba. Then you'll become a citizen. What's an Abba? Source. <laughs> as long as you call God God, you still ain't there. You got to get to the point where you finally say one day in your kitchen or in your bedroom while you're shaving in the bathroom, all of a sudden hits you. You know something? I and my father are one. It ain't there yet. See, when that happens, you'll now be afraid of the economy. When that happens, you're not concerned about governments falling apart because you're not hooked up to them. Your source is Jehovah himself. And that word source doesn't only mean supply, it means consistency. That means you got the same stuff that your source has. He says the Holy Spirit's job is to get you to the point where you begin to think like that. I am sure, you know, uh, Prince William, I understand, is supposed to be taking a break this month from school. And uh, they are sending him on a, 
a month-long tour to Africa. I was reading it in the papers when I was in England a couple of weeks ago. And I was reading this article, and it was very interesting. Uh, when he was a little boy, they say, a little boy, as soon as Princess D had him, they had a list of people already lined up to tutor him. They taught him how to speak, taught him how to walk. You see, because princes don't walk just like anybody. They teach him how to walk, how to put his steps, how to hold his hand in his pocket properly. If you notice during the funeral, he and his brother, look at the past, have the same positions. There's a way they're supposed to stand. There's a way that a royalty is supposed to look. And there are people, they they're not supposed to look at certain people. I mean, they were trained by tutors. They were not allowed to think like normal kids. Oh boy, normal. It's a terrible word. There are certain places they cannot go. They cannot be seen. Don't you get it? There are certain clubs the royalties can't be seen at. There are certain people they can't be seen hanging out with, like prostitutes and drug addicts. I mean, imagine Prince William being caught in the company of prostitutes. Boy, that would be a big disgrace. Newspapers everywhere would have it. And how come the saints still shacking up with prostitutes? In other words, when you get the mentality of a royalty, there's a certain way you look and walk and dress and keep company. There are certain words they cannot use. The tutors have to teach them everything. Their fingernails have to be tutored. They must keep their fingernails certain uh, ways manicured. There are certain ways they have to keep their hair. I mean, it's a weird thing to be a royalty. Your whole life is already laid out for you. And so it is with you in the kingdom of God. We must be retaught and retrained to think like God because we are sons of God and if we are sons then we are what joint is what do you think William is to that throne he's the next king if Queen Elizabeth lives long enough the Prince Charles doesn't make it William get it he's king so they, they, they're not Waiting until the throne is empty. Come on, y'all talk to me. God don't want you to wait till you get to heaven to start acting like heaven. He wants you to get this thing now. That's why the kingdom came to earth. My mentality is a result of a lot of training, or should I say retraining by that book you got in your hand through the Holy Spirit that lives inside of me. I had to be retrained. I was born the same place you were born, and maybe worse than some of you and I was taught and trained to think a certain way by my conditions but I thank God for parents who gave me a book and said look this book will get you out of here and then we had to be taught to actually not believe what our eyes saw we were taught to believe what the book said so when we saw poverty the book says you are more than blessed when we saw oppression, the book says you are more than a conqueror. So we got to be retrained in our mentality. This kingdom life is different. So William is going on this tour. They say his father is not going. He's going to spend a whole month in Africa on a safari. They said, but he'll be having his aid with him everywhere he goes. You've got an aid too. And the purpose for the aid is to make sure you act the way you were trained when you was home. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Some of you, when Monday comes, we don't know you no more. It's as if the aid left. The aid is still there. And he tells you, don't do that. You can't sit that way. You can't go with that person. You can't drink that. Oh, no, you weren't taught to smoke that. You can't do that no more. See, the aid is there to make sure you act royal. As long as God is your God, then you're afraid of him. But if he, if he also becomes your father, your Abba, then there's love. There's representation. 
That's why Christ says, He that have seen the Son, have seen the Father. He came to restore the rulership of that kingdom on earth through us. God really doesn't want to come to earth. He set it up for us to do that for Him. You and I were therefore given birth to represent God's rulership on earth. And that last part, to return the kingdom of heaven to God's earthly kings. Everybody say kings. Repeat after me. I am a king. Say it loud. Louder. Now I know some of you women are saying you're queens. That's not true. <laughs> Hallelujah. God created man and man is a spirit and spirits have no gender. So you are a ruler. Your body manifests your rulership, but you, every one of us here, was born to be a ruler on this earth representing God who, from whom we came. We have the same spirit out of God. Let me tell you how important the kingdom is. Look at what David preached about it. I want you to take a look at these verses very, very seriously because some of you think that the kingdom of God was preached by Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. No, the kingdom of God began in Genesis. Let's read what David says about it. David preached the kingdom of God. He says, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. That's Psalm 103, verse 19 and 20. Look at Psalm 145, verse 13. He says, your kingdom, O Lord, is what? An everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. The David talking. David had a consciousness of the kingdom of God, not of a religious order, not of religious church, not of an organization of religious people. He had a concept that was right. He says, your kingdom, O God, is established forever and it rules over all the earth. Thank God for David. What about Daniel? Did Daniel have a revelation? Daniel says, and please turn your Bibles, if you will, to Daniel chapter 7. Uh, Daniel chapter 2 is a good place to start first, and we can go to 7. Chapter 2 of Daniel. Everybody turn here, please, because sometimes we think again that Jesus is the only one that preached the kingdom. But remember that Jesus is the source of the kingdom. Here's what Daniel says in chapter 2. Underline this in your Bible, please. Verse 44. In the time of those kings, and Daniel, of course, had an awesome <laughs> revelation about the kingdom of God. You'd remember that Daniel was a permanent secretary in the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon. He's a powerful young man. And Daniel had a dream and a vision. And so did the king, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had a vision of this great statue that had all the different empires of the world in it. And, and it ended with a, with a clay and iron feet, which is what we have today called Europe, the European Union, which is iron and clay mixed together. They just held together, but they can't quite unify. Daniel saw this way back there. He saw Europe. And Daniel saw coming out of heaven, the king saw this actually, and Daniel explained it. The king says, and I saw a great stone come out of heaven, out of nowhere, a big stone, and it hit the statue and smashed it, and it fell. And when it was made to dust, then this rock began to grow. Daniel began to interpret the rock. He said, that rock is the kingdom of God coming out of heaven and hitting the kingdoms of earth, turning them into powder dust, and it begins to grow. Have you ever thought rocks don't grow? But the king says, I saw the rock growing. Christ says, upon this rock, I will start my church, and the gates of hell will not be able to what? Stop it. Notice the kingdom has no gates. Hell has the gates. Gates were used in those days to protect yourself from the outside enemy. So hell is the one who got gates. They're the ones who are afraid of us. 
We seem to be afraid of the world. The world is afraid of us. We're supposed to be growing, not shrinking. We're supposed to be advancing, taking over our community, over our territory, over our authority, over all of the earth. We're supposed to be expanding like the growing rock, but we seem to be the ones hiding from the world, hoping we leave. Daniel says, I saw a rock coming out of heaven. And he said, Nebuchadnezzar, that rock is the kingdom of God and nothing can stop its advance. Let's read what Daniel says about the kingdom. Verse 44, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. Everybody say amen. Boy, I like that. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. Tell neighbor, I'm a part of that government. Come on, say it again. You know, I got a, a fax instructing me to return to the United Nations as soon as possible because they have my credentials ready. And I'm so busy, I can't go to pick it up. So I got to go to New York to pick up my credentials as a United Nations affiliate. And I'm too busy working for the kingdom of God to go pick their kingdom stuff up. So I'll go and get it in a few weeks. And I was thinking, isn't it amazing? I'm a part of a kingdom that ain't going to be around because I'm a part of a kingdom that's going to be forever. Oh, that's all right. You don't need to clap. So, so what you are is, here you are, you work in a country, you work for a government, you work within a, an economy, you work on a job, and all of that is unpredictable. You can lose your job in the morning. But thank God you are not dependent on that kingdom that's going to fail. Daniel says they will all end, but this kingdom shall last forever. Tell your neighbor, I'm secure. You don't know how good I feel when I wake up in the morning. I tell you, when you wake up tomorrow morning, you should walk outside, open your car, drive to work, sit in your job and say, mm -hmm. no matter what happens, I'm okay. Because my kingdom, my government cannot be moved. Say amen, somebody. I mean, there are elections in every country this year, including ours, pending. And no matter who gets in power, who don't get in power, guess what? My king doesn't need to be voted in. He's still stable. That's why it's important not to be a religious person. Daniel says this kingdom will last forever. Look at Daniel chapter 7. Turn to chapter 7. Powerful stuff here. I was reading this again this morning and meditating on this. And Daniel really had a revelation of the kingdom. Daniel says in verse 9. As I looked, thrones were set in place. And the ancient of days took his seat. Ooh, 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 ooh. Can I just feast for a second? Mm. Ooh, that sounds so good. I don't know. That word is like honeycomb. Mm, sweet to the taste. Read that again. As I looked, the thrones were set in place, and the ancient of days took his seat. Guess who that is? Can you, can you see imagination? There are thousands of thrones. One of them is mine. <laughs> Daniel's talking about the kingdom of God. He says, I saw thousands of thrones but then someone walked in who was the throne of all the thrones the king of all the kings and he's called what the ancient of days why because he ain't got no beginning no no end everybody say that's my king say with a feeling shake your head and say it what's his name what's his name what's his name jesus Daniel says, I saw the ancient of days. He took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire. And its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing. Man, that's a dangerous looking guy. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Lord have mercy. Attended means they were doing stuff, just, just serving him. Just, I don't know what they were doing. They're just serving him. They were all waiting to need something to drink, need something to eat, need to fix the clothes. They were fixing him, 
fixing, fixing, fixing this, fixing that. I mean, thousands, read it. Now we're fixing him. Let me tell you something, friends. When you see him, you think you're going to be excited today. You're going to faint. He's going to be so awesome when you see him. He's going to fall out. Boom. Come back to him. Boom. Fall out again. Half your, half you can spend half of your life in heaven just out. Boom. Imagine seeing that. Daniel says thousands were attending him. That's my Lord. The court was seated and the books were open. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words of the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain. Everybody say he going to get his. Say it again. The beast going to get his. Don't worry about your adversary. He going to get his. He was slain as its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but were allowed to live for a period of time. Now, when was this written? Written before Calvary. Can I get deep? Daniel saw <laughs> the battle between darkness and light. And he said, I saw the beast destroyed, and then the beast's the plural was stripped. Satan was destroyed on Calvary. His power was taken. But the Bible says the beasts, his cohorts, were allowed to remain. That's why he's still around today. But the strong man cannot take over a strong man's house unless he first what? Binds the strong man. So Christ has done what? He has come into the world, he died on the cross, and he has bound a strong man. But he's allowed him to be around. Now my question is, you may, you may ask these questions to yourself. Why did God allow them, verse 12, to live for a period of time? Because the kids need training. So help me Lord. Am I making any sense? The reason why Slewfoot, that's Lucy Foot. And his demonic powers have not been completely banished yet. It's because you need training. The Bible says, <laughs> well, it is tough to teach because it's so simple. The Bible says, when you enter into trials and temptations and, and, and tests, he says, welcome them as friends, for they have come to what? Strengthen your faith and refine it into pure gold. In other words, God fired Lucifer from being a worshiper, rehired him to be a trainer to make his kids look good. So the devil is not really your enemy. He's the best training system you could have. The, oh, help me, Lord. He can never beat you. So the scriptures are very clear. The scriptures say, if you are tempted... Do not think it strange. For there is no temptation that has taken any man. That is not common to all men. For God will not allow you to be tempted beyond that which you are able to overcome. And he himself will make a way of escape. In other words, the reason why they were allowed to live is so that they can make you royal rulership over the kingdom of the earth I was telling someone this morning in my office that you never grow in good times write that down to yourself in good times you ain't growing that's why every successful person has a story I made a statement this week when I was in Cleveland, Tennessee, Cleveland, Ohio, rather, to a number of pastors. I'm telling them, God doesn't. I'm afraid to talk sometimes because people that tell me I'm off because they're not where I'm at. God doesn't give you anything, you qualify for it. 
I want you to think about that. God doesn't give free gifts. God is not Santa Claus. Even Santa Claus don't give you things. You got to qualify for them. Come on, sing Santa Claus song. What does it say? If you're being good. <laughs> Even Santa Claus got more sense than that. That's why the Bible is filled with words like if. When. If you will obey me, then I will bless you. He said, if you will obey me. There's something you got to do. God has left Satan and all of his cohorts without power but they are here because he wants them to help you become powerful to retrain you read the next statement in my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man who was speaking Daniel what was the name Christ gave himself? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Thousand years before, Daniel saw him as son of man. Christ says, I am the son of man. Read what it says about him. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. <laughs> he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power, and all peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. Who's that? Jesus. So you got the Father on the throne, ancient of days, you got Jesus, the Son of Man coming out from the throne and into the throne, and now he's given what? Power, authority. And he's given sovereign rule over all the nations of the world. But the good part is the next sentence. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away. And his kingdom is the one that will never be destroyed. What's it all about? It's about a kingdom. It's not about a religion. He came to give us a kingdom. Now, if you will, please read with me verse 18. I, Daniel, was troubled in my spirit. Verse 15. And the vision that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the true meaning. What's the meaning of all this? So he told me and he gave me the interpretation of these things. He says, the four beasts, bears, beasts are four kingdoms that will rise from the earth. But the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. And yes, forever and ever. Are you reading what I'm reading? Let's read it again. He says, The four beasts are four kingdoms that will rise from the earth. But the saints of the Most High will receive what? The kingdom. Not a kingdom. But the kingdom. Verse 18. And they will possess it. They will do what with it? Possess it. This is amazing. He says, the one who is in the midst of the throne shall receive sovereignty and kingdom then he shall give the kingdom to the saints and the saints shall what possess it this is prophecy before it happens he's talking about the coming of the son of man and what he's going to give to his saints he's going to give us not religion he's going to give us what rulership a kingdom and we will what possess it we have been sent to this planet to possess the kingdom of God and it is for how long? Forever. You know, you, let us read verse 27 and 28, which I thought was very, very graphic. It says, 
then the sovereignty power and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints I'm ready to go home now did you read what I just read are you sure <laughs> you and I have been taught that are going to be handed over to Jesus Jesus no I didn't lose it <laughs> let me ask you a question did man fall from heaven did man fall from heaven who fell from heaven Satan fell from heaven where did you fall from you fell from dominion if God gave you what you didn't lose then he has not restored you he has to give you what you lost then that's restoration Daniel says <laughs> that this is Daniel we're talking here now we're not talking about Jesus yet we can get to that next week but Daniel is saying look I saw the whole thing and when I saw it I saw the son of man coming and he was given sovereignty authority over what the kingdoms of the earth listen to me friends this is not heaven we're talking about you remember the words of Jesus oh if you could just know what I know Jesus went to the cross gave up the ghost spirit left his body was put in a tomb Christ went direct to Hades went into Gehenna went into Sheol knocked open the doors of hell walked in and said Lucifer I come for the keys picked up the keys of death out in the grave slammed the door back said I'll be back for you later walks out then he comes back to the grave gets back in his body and the third day he has the keys and he walks out and then he says what all authority see read it right there Daniel says he was given authority over heaven and earth and under the earth and then it says what he handed it over to the saints don't you get it this is not about keeping church and singing songs this is about going out on Monday morning saying my father's property is my property the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the real estate belongs to my daddy when they fire you tell them I'm going to work in another part of my daddy's vineyard his kingdom shall last how long forever if you're not born again today you better get born again now because you are a part of a kingdom that ain't gonna work it's gonna fail you're gonna get fired you're gonna have depression you're gonna have sickness and disease you're gonna lose without the kingdom of God but if you become a part of the kingdom of God when they fail you win when they lose you succeed why because your kingdom will reign forever give him a praise offering anyhow can we just finish this and sweet the last part is sweet I got 10 minutes they tell me all right look at this write this down please it says then the sovereign power and greater the kingdom of God under the whole earth was handed over to the saints the people of the most high his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all rulers will worship and obey him say amen all rulers will worship and obey him all rulers will worship and obey him what are you a ruler 
All rulers will worship and obey him. Now let me give you a revelation that I never thought of in my life. Only the Holy Ghost can give you this revelation. Philippians chapter 2, you all know it. It says, let the same mind that was in Christ be within you. Same attitude. That even though he was God, didn't think it a big deal to be God. Because you can't be proud of what you are anyhow, because that's what you are. You don't got to think of it as a big deal. See, you're only a big deal when, you, when you're trying to be something you're not. <laughs> that's why you don't got to wear Nike and, 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 and Saint Laurent to be important no more, because now you are king's kid, whether you wear plastic or ter terraline. Come on, man, sit up straight. Get me, get me before I go here. See, if, if Abba is your father, then you can live in Baintown and be happy. You know that ain't permanent address, plus you make the house a castle anyhow. You don't need a good car to ride a chariot. You make the thing a chariot if it's a Toyota or a bike. You the royalty. You give it the royalty. The same chapter, Philippians chapter 2 says, He became as man and took on the form of a servant and became obedient even unto death. The death of the cross. Watch this. So that God gave him a name. Same name. Jesus. That at the name of Jesus. Watch this. Every knee. If you got a knee. Whether you're a horse or a man. A roach or a dog. Come on somebody. Every knee. Hallelujah. Shall what? Bow. In heaven. And in heaven. Earth and under the earth. That means two foot got knees. How many knees going to bow? Every knee. Now here's the revelation. Daniel says, when I saw him, he gave the kingdom to the saints. And he says, all rulers bow. Now you are a ruler. So even though you are a king, he's the king of? So you got to bow to the? king even though you are a king now if you ain't saved you're still gonna bow because you're still a ruler that's the revelation see an unsaved person is still a ruler they're made in God's image created to rule but they don't know it yet so even those in hell gotta bow because they're rulers they are unfulfilled rulers frustrated rulers depressed rulers but they're rulers anyhow I mean, an, a fallen angel will have to bow. So you better bow now and reign than just bow and be depressed forever. Can I hear an amen? amen. Tell your neighbor, I'm already bowed and it feels good. See, when you bow to the king of kings, then he gives you your kingship. He is the end of the matter. Look at the last statement. Daniel says, and when, that, when I saw that, he says, that was the end of the matter. Underline that. This is the end of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by my thoughts, and my face turned pale, but I kept it to myself. You know, I would do the same thing if I saw that. Because all my life I've been taught that I'm nothing but a no good roach, saved by grace, barely scraping my way into the kingdom. Trying to make it to heaven on a door string. Hope we make it in praise to the Lord. And then all of a sudden Daniel showed us that we were given the whole thing. We were in charge. And he, even though he was the king, he let us be in charge. Daniel says, I became faint because I saw the end of the whole matter. He said, this whole thing is about you ruling in the kingdom of God. Close your Bibles. Let's pray. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.